Hello, my name is Nathan, and I guess I'm starting this channel now. So I'm going to be learning Japanese, and I want to document the process that I go through doing that. So first, a bit of background. I've been, I've already been studying Japanese off and on for about two years already, and I'm still probably not even at a JLPT N5 level. So there's basically two reasons for that, I think, uh, aside from <laughs> just laziness, although I suppose the off and on aspect of it is that. But one is that off and on nature of it. It was very off and on. I have not been studying it straight for two years. I have you know, just kind of started studying, got bored of it, or frustrated and stopped and then come back to it again later, that sort of thing. But the second thing is just a lot of false starts. And I think that's also played into sort of the off and on nature of it is I would start learning Japanese a certain way and would realize that this probably isn't very effective and that would be discouraging. Not necessarily because of lack of progress, just, I don't know, I got a gut feeling that this is not how language learning really works or something like that. So I would stop. Uh, and so in a lot of ways, I feel like I have spent the last two years figuring out how to learn a language rather than actually learning one. Aside from trying to learn Japanese, I have never acquired a second language before, so this is the first time I've even really tried. Also, next year, in March, probably probably March, uh, the, the timing on that is a little bit flexible, but I will be moving to Japan to work as an assistant language teacher in the Japanese public school system. So I'm really looking forward to that, to that for a variety of reasons, one of which is I just love kids and I think it'll be a fun experience. It'll be great to experience Japan. Uh, I do love teaching. I am not any under. I'm not under any illusions that assistant language teachers really do that much proper teaching. But nevertheless, as much as I can help out, that'll be great. So yeah, I'm really excited about that. But that also definitely affects my Japanese language learning. So the last piece of information about me, background-wise, is that I'm 33 years old. And I bring that up because I feel like there's this idea out there that as you get older, you can't learn new things. And especially languages is something that people talk about a lot in terms of you need to learn it when you're younger. And at least to achieve some level of, some particular level of fluency that they're imagining in their heads. And... It's not entirely clear to me that that's actually the case, and I think in many cases people shoot themselves in the foot, telling themselves that they can't learn something because they're too old, and that becomes a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy. But so I bring up that I'm 33 not because that's a particularly old age, but because it's definitely older than people think of kind of prime time for new language learning. So I just want to note that for anyone who's curious, and I think this could be an interesting case study for learning a language when you're older. So with that background out of the way, I now want to talk a little bit about the approach that I'm going to be taking for learning Japanese, which is the AJAT method, or a rough approximation of the AJAT method. So AJAT stands for All Japanese All the Time, and I don't think it's actually specific to Japanese, this is just sort of the coins acronym that's been applied to basically doing this for Japanese. Uh, but the core idea of it, at least as I understand it, certainly the aspect of it that makes the most sense to me, is that learning language is actually all about input. As you just get input, you listen to it all the time, or at least as much as you can, and it's that process that actually allows you to learn the language. It's not studying textbooks, like all that stuff is, like it can be helpful as supplementary activity, but it's not the actual learning of the language. The learning happens from the listening. And I, I won't go too much more into detail about like why I think this makes sense, uh, but I will say this is the first, uh, I guess, theory of language acquisition or kind of approach to language acquisition uh, that actually just makes sense to me. <laughs> like the first thing I've run across, I'm like, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's going to work because everything else I've run across has been... Uh, it's like, oh, maybe that'll work. Okay, I'll give this a try. And then I get frustrated with it. But yeah, so that's more or less the method I'm going to be uh, approaching with. So now that the approach that I'm going to be taking is out of the way, now I want to talk about my goals because it's 
really easy to say like, oh, well, I want to learn Japanese, but what does that actually mean for me, right? What, what are the specific goals that I have? Because that is going to vary from person to person. So a lot of people that are taking or using the AJAP method, their goals are native level fluency. They want to speak as close to indistinguishable from a native as possible with accents and like perfect grammar, I mean, perfect grammar, not in a textbook sense, but in a actual real spoken language sense. Uh, they want to be just absolutely perfect at Japanese. That is not my goal. And I want to be upfront about that because when I don't achieve that, because I stop early or you know, stop early, I want to be clear that that was my intent from the beginning, right? My lack of achieving that is not from a lack of uh, potential. Um, and I, I want to make that clear, especially because of my note about my age earlier, uh, but it's because like I have different goals. So what my goal is, so I can probably explain this best by comparing to non-native English speakers that I know. As a native English speaker, I am very good at judging how good someone is at English and how easy it is to communicate with them. So there are non-native English speakers that I have worked with before who are difficult to communicate with, or at least it takes like more effort than I would prefer to communicate with them because they have maybe like a really thick accent that makes it hard to parse what they're saying, or they have some really strange phrasing that they use frequently or don't really seem to construct English sentences quite correctly. And it just takes that much extra effort to communicate with them. I can communicate with them, right? Like it's, it's always worked out in the end, but it just, it, it feels like you're just putting so much effort into like communicating with this person that's really frustrating sometimes. And you kind of don't want to talk to them, you know, if you can help it after a while. Not, I mean, I mean, I hope I'm not a bad person. <laughs> it's just like, I think as human beings, that sort of like sense of like effort and frustration is something we kind of naturally avoid. So it's not about the person. Or who, or who they are in any way. It's just, it's hard to communicate with them. So I want to avoid that, right? Like, I definitely don't want to be that in Japanese. But there are other non-native English speakers that I've worked with that even though they definitely have an accent and there's, you know, occasional things that they phrase like a little bit weird, it's never hard to communicate with them. It's very, it's a very fluid process communicating with them. It's effortless. It's fun. Uh, and in a lot of ways, I, like... I like their accents, right? Like, accents are cool. I, I like that variety in the English language, right? Uh, accents both for native speakers of various different countries, but also for non-native uh, speakers from various countries. I think that's a really cool thing about language is that accents. So I'm actually really okay with having an accent in Japanese, as long as it's not confusing, right? As long as it's really easy for people to understand. It doesn't take them any effort, right? If it takes any effort for them to understand me because of my accent, that's not good. Like, I don't want that. But an accent that just sounds different, right? It sounds a little bit different. I'm super okay with that. 100% okay with that. I mean, in some ways, I, I almost prefer that, right? Again, because I like accents in English from non-native English speakers. So why should I avoid that for myself learning Japanese? Because maybe that's something, maybe not every Japanese person is going to like that, but maybe that's something that people actually appreciate, you know? So uh, it just seems like trying to achieve a perfect native accent would be so much effort for so little payoff, at least as far as I'm concerned, what, for what I care about. So, uh, and then, yeah, like phrasing things like a little bit weird sometimes, I'm, again, really okay with that as long as it's not at all difficult to understand. So a good example of this is uh, some of the non-native English speakers that I've worked with before there's the phrase, so it, for actual English speakers that speak, native English speakers who speak it natively, there's the phrase, what it's like and how it is, right? Or what it is like and how it is. And both of those phrases mean pretty much the same thing. So if you're, you know, asking like, oh, like, how is it, right? Or what is it like, or that, that sort of thing. But the, these particular non-native English, English speakers that I've worked with before kind of combine the two and turn it into how it's like. They're like, oh, well, how, how is it like? And it sounds a little bit weird, right? 
but it's completely clear what they mean. And when you've listened to it enough times, it almost becomes kind of endearing, right? So I'm okay with that sort of thing. I'm not, again, I'm not going to, I'm not going to intentionally foster strange phrasing. Like I don't want to do that, right? Because then I'll just end up with, if I'm intentionally trying to foster weird phrasing, that's going to probably not, not end, end well. But if I accidentally have a little bit of weird phrasing here and there, as long as it's not at all a problem for people understanding me, and as long as it's not just completely wildly grammatically incorrect, I'm, again, super okay with that. So the third thing is just general communication ability. So my benchmark for this, and I don't know how many experiences I'll have to verify this, but probably through like reading and things I can at least get a sense of this, is... So I work as an animator, uh, I've also worked as a software developer and a UX designer, and these are potentially complex topics that have like subtle things about them. And if you're doing animation cri critiques, for example, there's you need to be able to communicate effectively and subtly about that animation to give a critique uh, well, or if you're receiving a critique to understand that critique well, Similarly, in computer science, there's all kinds of things you want people to communicate about that are complex and subtle, and so on and so forth. So I want to be at the level of Japanese where like that stuff is not a problem for me. Which is, let me clarify that though, because until you learn the terminology in those fields in a particular language, you can't communicate in, in them, right? And that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about like literally actually being able to communicate about those specific topics, but I mean being at a level of Japanese where if I do learn the uh, sort of terms of art, that then I would be able to communicate about those topics, right? To, to have complex, real conversations about them without any particular, without any more difficulty than I already do in English. So that is my goal communications wise. And maybe that could probably be described as like native level fluency, right? So to recap my goals, Pronunciation, easy to understand, but I'm okay with having a foreign accent. Phrasing, a, a few things here and there that aren't quite phrased in the normal way people would, but aren't wildly grammatically incorrect, I'm okay with, as long as it's easy to understand. But I do want most of my language to be very correct and fluent. And then communication ability overall, that is the one where I really want it to be native level, right? Like I want to be at a point where like that I can communicate about anything as long as I know the terms of art. So, okay, so those are my goals. Finally, uh, I want to just end with a wrap up of kind of where I'm at right now. So I've pretty much just started the AJAP process properly. So I have been doing remembering the kanji for about two months now, and I'm doing it, so actually, hold on one second. This thing, remembering the kanji, and it's sometimes referred to just as RTK, makes sense, R-T-K, <laughs> and it's a great book for learning kanji, I cannot recommend it enough, I'm up to about 500 and... I have to look it up again, but it's over 500 kanji that I know the meanings of and how to write now. So I'm just doing that at a rate of 10 kanji a day. I know that many people who do AJATs do it at like 20 or 25 a day. That's awesome. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> 10 a day is fine for me. So that's kanji. Oh, and just to motivate this a little bit for anyone who's watching this that maybe has not studied Japanese before, so I know how to read and write hiragana and katakana, but kanji I put off because it's really intimidating, right? It's like, oh, there's so many, so many characters. How am I ever going to remember all of these? Oh, it's, I'll, I'll put that until later. I'll, I'll learn Japanese and then learn kanji later. And turns out that's not really how it works. So, and the reason for that is because you pretty much isolate yourself to this tiny, tiny, it's not even a bubble, it's almost like a pinhead of material that you can actually even attempt to read if you don't know kanji. And that pinhead is basically the material in textbooks for Japanese learners. That's 
pretty much it. I mean, there's a little bit out, more out there maybe, but like that's pretty much it. So if you want to be able to start learning language by inputs, which again is the theory behind this, uh, knowing the kanji is like, it's basically part of the Japanese alphabet. It's like only learning three letters in English, in the English alphabet, if you're trying to learn English. It's like, okay, well, you can try and find books that only use those three letters, but good luck. So just having the entire alphabet, so to speak, in your head is really useful for exposing yourself to new material and being able to start reading it without having to just look up the kanji every single time. So just getting all of that out of the way to start with, I really wish I had done this at the very beginning when I started my kind of off and on. Well, I mean, I wish I'd started out with this method in general when I started. Uh, but yeah, I definitely wish that I had started off learning kanji as well way back uh, a couple years ago. But, you know, now I can fix it. So doing it now. Okay, so that's kanji. Now for input, which is kind of the, the most important part or the foundation of the AJET method, and I think language learning in general, as I talked about before. I've been doing that for about two, three weeks now, so not very long at all. And the approach that I'm taking to this, well, I'll talk about the specific resources and tools later, but the, the general approach that I'm taking is twofold. So one of them is watching Japanese television shows and anime without subtitles of any kind. So uh, no Japanese subtitles and definitely not English subtitles. It's like just the show and that's it. Watching that and that's really enjoyable. And as I'm watching that, I will record the audio for it. And so then when I'm done with an episode, I'll just do like a little bit of audio processing on the record, like some uh, compression, uh, not as in like compressing file size, but as in evening out uh, volume levels across the whole thing. And then I'll just toss that onto a little uh, portable audio player, music player that I, that I have. And then I'll just have that with me and my headphones with me at all, all times. And whenever I'm not doing something that requires uh, like singular attention, I'll just pop those in. And so that's certainly not all the time. Uh, so, I mean, it's supposed to be all Japanese all the time. Uh, I'm not doing that. Uh, it's more like all Japanese when I have the chance. <laughs> and so, uh, that, I mean, that's still a lot of time. So anytime I'm like on a bus and transits, um, I mean, it's actually, it actually is a lot of time. There's kind of more cracks, little, just little openings in your day than you maybe think there are. But any any time that I'm like talking with someone, socializing, you know, it's rude to have your headphones and I'm not <laughs> doing that. Uh, any time that I am working, uh, particularly on tasks that require a lot of mental attention, I'm not doing that because I don't want to be distracted. And you know, I <laughs> respect my professional responsibilities, so I'm not going to be screwing my clients just because I'm trying to learn Japanese. But yeah, whenever I'm, but anytime that I'm not doing anything that requires singular attention, I just pop those in. And so yeah, that's that's pretty much it. So I'm just kind of accumulating audio as I that I can put on my portable audio player as I'm watching TV shows, and I'm just trying to watch TV shows, at, you know, certainly every day and at least one episode a day. I try to do more, but that depends on how much free time I have available. So yeah, that's kind of the the, gen the general approach. So the last thing that I want to say about the AJET method, at least for this video, is that the process is actually really enjoyable. And I want to point that out because when you first look at or read information about the AJET method, it can seem like reading through it at first, like it's, it, or listening to someone explain it, it can sound like it's gonna just be like this grind and it's gonna be like really annoying and like it's gonna take so much effort and ah, I don't know if it's so intense, you know, like, ah, this, is, this, doesn't, this doesn't seem like something I can do. Uh, but it's actually not like that at all, right? I don't think very many people would, I mean, I, theoretically not many people do stick with it, but I, I don't think that's because it's a grind, right? And I'll get to that in, in just one second. But the only part of this that is a grind is the uh, kanji, right? That initial investment in learning the kanji. And so, I mean, that that is a grind, right? But you can take it slow, like I'm doing, and then it's really not that bad because it's just like maybe an hour a day or something. Uh, and you could even do less, right? If you want to do, 
I have five kanji a day, right? Yeah, it'll take you twice as long as it's going to take me to learn all of them, but you'll still get there, right? So whatever amount you want to do, right, whatever feels not overwhelming, just do that for the kanji and get through them over time. But the rest of the method, at least as far as I've been doing it so far, right, I've only been doing it for two or three weeks, so we'll see how I feel about this later. But at the moment, it just seems like it's fun, right? Like, you're just watching TV. You're just watching TV. Well, and recording and listening to it. But, like, neither of those things are difficult, right? They don't take energy. They don't take effort. You're still watching TV. If you enjoy Japanese media to begin with, you're going to enjoy this process. It's still going to be fun. Yeah, you're not going to understand everything that they're saying, or especially at first, you're not going to understand anything that they're saying, except for me, like, nani, you know, <laughs> the the five Japanese words that every uh, anime fan knows. But uh, yeah, you're pretty much not going to be understanding anything. And, but it turns out that's fine, right? Because it's visual storytelling, so you can still follow the story in a lot of cases, or at least the rough plot points. And also, it's visual entertainment, so it is visually entertaining. So even when you're not completely following things, it can still be, f and usually is, still fun to watch. Um, so just find stuff that you enjoy watching, even without subtitles, and, like, it's fine. Like, and it's you're just having fun, enjoying the TV show. Like, that is really how it feels. So, yeah, so I just wanted to point that out, that it's, uh, it, it is... And this is what I wanted to say about people not sticking with it, is I think the reason that people don't stick with it isn't because it takes effort, it's because it takes time, right? And so keeping those two things separate, because they are different, like, things taking effort and things taking time are two different things, like, those are two different axes. And AJAD is, like, very, very high on the taking your time axis, but very, very low on the effort axis, at least as I've experienced it so far. So finally, since this is the introductory video, I'd like to take a moment to talk about my plans for the channel. So I expect this is not going to be a channel that has like frequently released videos. My guess is it'll be every couple of months or something, uh, because this is mostly just for me tracking my own progress, and I don't think huge amounts of progress are probably going to be made in increments more than like a couple of months, or notable progress probably not going to be made in increments more than a couple of months. So yeah. And also probably wouldn't be very interesting for other people watching this for me to like make a video and be like, hey, like I'm still more or less at the same level I was last time I made a video. So, uh, yeah, but I'll try to make I'll try to make a video every couple of months, and yeah, we'll see how things go from there. So, welcome to the channel, and bye. I don't. How do you close videos like this? See ya. No, that's pretty bad. Well, okay.